terrifying tales of abuse. We were like prisoners. This is children being sexually, physically, and emotionally abused on a daily basis. Inside this elite British boarding school. Our headmaster was a pedophile and a sadist. Told by the brother of Princess Diana, the uncle of the future king, and godchild of the queen, Charles Spencer. Human beings are capable of very dark acts. There is no social or financial privilege that's going to get you out of the firing line. What he says happened to him and dozens of others. And you could see the blood, the, the, the split skin. This has not been out there. This is a first. Yes, it is. Revealing secrets locked inside for nearly 50 years. She would come round to my bed when others were asleep. Silence and secrets. Charles Spencer's very private school. We're now in Maidwell Village. The heart of it is this school, the school that shaped my life. You get a view of part of the school at the back. It was gray and wet the day Charles Spencer took me to see the British boarding school he can't bear to remember, but can never forget, Maidwell Hall. Half country manor house and half prison camp. We used to have to walk down there to be beaten. We were locked away. We were like prisoners. We were prey to very bad people's worst instincts. He says that the worst of those bad people was the school's headmaster, Mr. Porch. Our headmaster was, in my view, a pedophile and a sadist. And he staffed the school himself with either people who were going along with what he was doing or were going to be mute about it. In his new book, A Very Private School, he describes behavior that was not just bleak, but often criminal. This is not a bunch of mid-teen, late-teen kids going through a rough school. This is children being sexually, physically, and emotionally abused on a daily basis. That has to affect you. You either bottle it up and try and soldier on, or you go ahead emotionally hobbled for the rest of your life. We sat down with Spencer, a best-selling author and historian, for his first interview about the book at Althorpe, home to his ancestors since 1508. With this magnificent stable and over 10,000 acres of farm and parkland. Inside, priceless paintings by Van Dyck and others. It's also his famous sister's burial place. So much of what you write about, I think, will leave readers speechless. So contrary to everything we think about, um, the privileged life, all the money, the home, being the godson of the queen, which you are. I told a friend of mine about this recently, and he said, I just can't believe you weren't protected, as if coming from this incredibly privileged background somehow would be a protection against pedophiles and sadists. But there is no protection against those sorts of people. Despite all the family's wealth and status, as a child, he was particularly vulnerable. I mean, your mother mm. left the family when you were two. Mm. Yes, that was a, a big bombshell. Actually, I can remember the moment when I was told that my mother would be home soon by the housekeeper. I could tell, like children can instinctively, that this was a well-meaning lie. I knew she wasn't coming back. And I didn't know why, but she, I knew she wasn't. And that was a very traumatic moment. And fair to say, after your mother's departure, your father appears to have sunken into a terribly deep depression. Yes. So my father came from an age and a background where the thought of getting any help would have been unthinkable. And so he soldiered on, but my memory of him is as a, a man who was broken. And I'd walk past his study, his office at home, and he'd be slumped in despair. He was a very loving father, but he was not fully emotionally functioning, I don't think. You would be served dinner by the staff on a tray alone. It's so bizarre, but I think it was a sort of hangover from the 19th century of the place of a child, and a child was to be seen and not heard. 
but he was as much a victim as I was of this very structured, old-fashioned way of thinking, a way of thinking that made it okay to send your child away to live with unregulated strangers in charge of your life. His sister Diana became his protector. He still has the little red coat he wore standing next to her at the local day school they attended together. My first day there, the headmistress said Diana wouldn't settle in the classroom. And she said, go on, go and check on him. And Diana ran out and came and looked into my classroom to see I was okay. And then she came back and said to the headmistress, he's fine. But by eight, he'd be on his own at Madewell. He says now that he was trying to be brave in this photo taken with Diana the day he left, but that his eyes stung with tears. Everyone went to schools like I did. It's a sort of upper class tradition. And the most important code of this very flawed regime that I was part of uh, was never to tell tales. The secrets the 75 boys at Madewell, ages 8 to 13, kept were dark. Every week, at least half a dozen would be whipped with a cane. And we all had showers together after sports. And you could see the blood, the, the, the split skin. So you'd do five strokes, breaking the skin on your buttock, and then a sixth across the other five to, as a sort of signature. Uh, and, and I have friends now who, a contemporary of mine who is also 59, and he still has the scars on his buttocks from the last time he was beaten was in 1977. What might the offence be? The offence might be jumping across, trying to jump from one side of a flower bed to another and catching your heel in the uh, dirt. Most regularly, it was academic. And interestingly, the boys who were chosen tended to be of a physical type that the headmaster seemed to like. He liked athletic boys and he liked uh, blonde boys. And they found themselves on the roster to be beaten on Saturday mornings an awful lot for supposedly failing at work. Well, one of them who was beaten, I think, pretty much every Saturday when I was there, got into Cambridge very easily. He wasn't stupid at all, but the headmaster needed to beat him for some reason. Another story about Mr. Porch from a former student, one of the two dozen he interviewed. He remembers the headmaster. He would come round in the dormitories in the evening and play games, card games or board games with boys. But as he remembered um, this contemporary of mine, he would catch you cheating the headmaster. He'd sort of encourage you to cheat and then put you over his knee where he was clearly aroused and fondle you as a sort of punishment for cheating in the way he had just encouraged you to. So it was, it was quite dark. Spencer says there are several reasons he thinks parents, by and large, did not ask questions. The only communication with our parents was one letter a week home written under supervision on a Sunday, and the master in charge would put up the subjects we were allowed to cover in the letter. And so it was very controlled. The parents apart from your sort of first day there. They never came into the school. They came into the grounds and were not allowed in. Even on a birthday, they weren't allowed to visit you. And I would say the parents, on the whole, just weren't paying attention at all, didn't want to know. I have a theory. So the, the old money there sort of thought, well, this is going to make my son tougher and more successful. And then people who had made money more recently thought, well, this is what... They do, and we want to be part of this set, so we're just going to keep really quiet. There's one mother I know who came from a less privileged background, and she was so thrilled that her son was at this school that when he went home with his buttocks beaten into a bloody pulp, she quietly, for two weeks, took his underpants covered in blood and washed them without asking him a single question because... She felt so excited to have her son mixing with well-known families. Abuse came from some of the teachers, too. There was one particularly violent master, and he caught me by myself in a changing room going out to play cricket. And he just grabbed me and threw me over his knee. And cricket boots have spikes on the metal spikes. And he beat me and beat me and puncturing my um, behind. Saying anything to you? Nothing. There was nothing said. He was really dangerous. And, you know, when I think of him now, I just, I mean, he's dead. Uh, 
but it still sends a shiver down my spine. He was terrifying. Another incident when, after his father inherited Althorpe, Charles gained a new title. Soon after that, I was doing a cross-country run, and suddenly, out of nowhere, because I didn't hear him coming up, one of the masters came up and whipped me with the uh, rope on his whistle. So it cut the back of my legs open, and I screamed in uh, shock. And he said, you know, get a move on, my lord. And it was, it was, you could see the resentment. And all I was was an 11-year-old on a run. But he says it would be another staff member who would leave the worst scars when we return. Maidwell Hall, the school at which I boarded from the age of 8 to 13, was built on a lie common to institutions of its type, on the cock and bull notion that children were better off under its roof, learning to be biddable, influential members of society, rather than living as we should have done, as nature intended, with our families. In his new book, A Very Private School, Charles Spencer details the unthinkable physical abuse, he says, he and dozens of others suffered at Madewell Hall. Human beings are capable of very dark acts, and there is no social or financial privilege that's going to get you out of the firing line. But what has truly haunted him was being sexually abused at the age he was in this portrait. Eleven. The predator, he says, a young female member of the staff charged with taking care of the young boys. It would start with her coming round after the lights were turned out in the dormitory and giving any boy awake, uh, maybe cookies, maybe grapes. And anyway, within a few days, she would come round to my bed when others were asleep and uh, kiss me, you know, French kiss, for ages. And it was so... Such, uh, I, if I was 17, 18, it would be a different thing, but I was 11. It was so confusing. He says kissing turned into intense fondling. He also says he wasn't alone. There was a group of boys she was sexually abusing. They talked about it at the time. More recently, he says, he interviewed two of them, who told him she raped them. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say it was thrilling, especially in, a, in an emotional desert such as that place was. And she was very good at chatting to us and being funny and t laughing at the other members of staff and all that. You felt this secret world in this, in this harsh, harsh place. But of course, it was terrible. And she would set us off against each other, the ones who were her chosen ones. She would emotionally suddenly turn her back on you and the others would all do the same. And then she'd allow you back into her circle. She pretended she was going to have to leave early to keep us all on tenterhooks, really. And I remember cutting myself as a sort of, I thought, if I hurt myself enough, then God will let her stay. So oh, even when I hear myself saying this, you realize how completely messed up the whole thing is. But an 11-year-old cannot process this stuff. And the completion of this seduction and perversion by this old lady came about when I was 12. I had not had sexual intercourse with the predator. Uh, and I was in Italy, staying in a hotel, and spotted a, what had been identified by my mother and stepfather as a prostitute outside. And I took my pocket money, and had, I lost my virginity to a prostitute. And I see that as the completion of what she had done to me. He does not name the female staff member who he says abused him in his book. Do you know whether she's alive? I've employed a private detective before to look her up. And I imagine she's still alive. She seems to have disappeared. She's been married a couple of times and all that. But um, no, I've never, and, and actually, I've no wish to ever see her again in my life. Um, There's no feeling of wanting to confront her with what she did to you and the others? It's too much. The physical abusers, not the sexual abusers. I always had a fantasy about confronting them, but not the sexual abuser, no, it's too much. Nearly 50 years later, the emotion, the trauma of it all flood to the room. Who's the first person you ever told what had happened to you? a therapist when I was about 42. You kept this inside? 
Yes. And he said, whisper to me one thing you've never told anyone. And I said, I was sexually abused by a woman when I was a child. Over the five years he took to write his memoir, some of the two dozen former students he interviewed told him about abuse they'd suffered, often worse, he says, than his own. Everyone I've spoken to who had a particularly bad experience at the school, they haven't told anyone. I mean, two of the people I spoke to who, one was raped at the age of nine at the school, and the other was appallingly physically uh, abused. They hadn't told their wives. And they were in their mid-50s. Hearing their stories nearly broke him, he says. I'm not asking for any sympathy, but writing this book was unbelievably difficult with screaming nightmares and depression in its weirdest forms and times when I just thought, I can't do this. And I don't think it's been much fun to have been around me for a lot of this process because I went into dark, dark places and I was in shock. It took a lot of courage to write this. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't honestly feel I had a choice. It was a book that demanded it be written and I obeyed that instinct. One conversation with a former Madewell student was particularly hard. He had been raped by someone else. Then he told me all these terrible, terrible things. And I said to him, look, I, this is so appalling. I'd taken 10 pages of notes. And I said, this is so bad, I can't write about it. And then he became animated for the first time and he seized my arm and he said, somebody has to tell our story. And this is what came from that. Spencer writes at points as if he is still processing it all, still raging at the little boy he once was, who didn't fight back. My disappointment in myself for this unconditional surrender has only grown as I've aged. This memoir is, I now see, my attempt to right that wrong some five decades on. I've retraced the steps of the boys who walked beside me then and have tried to make sense of the failings of those adults who let us down so terribly. Along the way, I have to say, with surprise as well as relief, that I feel I have reclaimed my childhood. There's a little bit of anger at the little boy that he didn't stand up. Mm. I know logically now. There was literally nothing I could do. No. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I can't believe I went along with it. How have you talked to your own children about the book? I have let them know it's coming because, of course, it's, it's going to rock the boat a bit. I gave an early copy to my... 29-year-old son, and he couldn't read it. He had nightmares. And he, 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 he woke up one night having thrashed around in bed, and it, he, just, he read half of it and said, I just can't read it. It was so not what his childhood was like. What does Madewell Hall have to say when we return? One of the most formidable traditions in England is that of the boarding school. Deep in the tape library of NBC News, a final strange twist. Five seconds. Ten years after Madewell, having graduated from Oxford, Charles Spencer, as a young journalist, filed a story about Madewell. Among the various and interesting roles that you have played in your life, one was as a correspondent for the Today Show. Yes. Good morning, Brian. The British and Americans share many things, their language, democratic principles, and to a large extent, their history. In my initial year there, they wanted me to look at Britain and explain Britain, particularly privileged Britain, to the Today Show viewer. You did a segment back in 1987 about Madewell, and I want your reaction to what you said. I remember one line. I said, it may look like a, a country, country club, club for extremely small gentlemen. <laughs> These boys are developing qualities which the English traditionally admire. The difficult thing for an outsider to appreciate is how a mother can send away an eight-year-old child. For the English upper middle classes, it's a natural part of growing up. I was uh, 23 then. I still hadn't come to terms with what those years had meant. But I seem to have had a an inkling that it was bad. Remembering that at this point you still have told no one mm. what actually happened to you. 
while presenting a very, you know, a country club for young gentlemen mm. view, mm. at the end, that's where, you know, off script, mm. it finally seeps out in that last minute. Did you enjoy your years there? I mean, do you remember them fondly, or is enjoyment not part of the equation? Well, I think it's much more fun these days, where it's a competitive market and they have to lay on the uh, entertainment. But uh, we were beaten <laughs> and things, which just doesn't happen now. Oh, well, you say beaten, I mean, you mean spanked. Uh, with a cane. That's beaten. You can't let Brian get away with just saying, well, That's they true. spanked you. Yes. You have to say. It's true. So there's an element of Stockholm Syndrome about these places where you have to go along with it. I had done my best to give a nice package to the American TV audience, but I couldn't lie. The American view of the Brits, is, of, of the sort of privileged class, is these sort of stiff upper lip repressed figures. Well, it, they are right, because a lot of them have been to these schools where emotion wasn't welcome. Um, if somebody started crying for any reason, you would run from them because it was so toxic. It was considered such a, a failure of character to cry, whether from physical or emotional pain, that it was just not part of your uh, makeup. You weren't allowed to be associated with it, let alone do it yourself. The publication of his book may draw him into a new battle, a criminal one. Madewell Hall is taking his allegations seriously and told NBC News they have contacted the British authorities charged with investigating allegations of child harm. We will follow their guidance on what we do from this point. We would encourage anyone with similar experiences to come forward and contact those local authorities or the police. While Spencer's allegations are confined to the 1970s, the law in Britain is different than in the U.S. In Britain, there is no statute of limitations on sexual abuse or rape. Somewhere out there, there is a 70-something-year-old woman who did unspeakable things to you and to other boys. Is it okay with you that she... No, it's not okay. Never is punished? No, that's not okay with me. But I honestly, to go through a case, I've, I've, this is my case. And that's what I've, I, I, I happen to write. And this is the way I've dealt with it. And if prosecutors were to come to you now and say, if, if I tell you, uh, well, I, I think what I would do in that circumstance is go to the two who I know were properly, they, they had sex and intercourse with her, and say, what do you want to do about it? Because that's more horrific still. And if they wanted to do something, I'd fully support them. If they chose not to, I don't know. He dedicates the book to Buzz. That was the nickname I had in my family before I went to Maidwell. And that was the boy who had part of him snuffed out during those five years at the school. So I wanted to reconnect with the carefree, happy little guy I was before I was sent to this place. Mission accomplished? I think mission accomplished in that. I read this recently for the audio version of it, and it was very emotional. But when I finished, I'm not capable of writing a perfect book but I did feel there's not a single word I'd change. And that is all I can hope for. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.